Welcome to Stand, your weekly audio adrenaline supplement. We believe that oftentimes the victory is just in the standing, standing for what you believe, standing for others, and standing for what's right. I'm Kelly Chewbacca, a former government watchdog, candidate for U.S. Senate, and as always, I'm joined by my favorite co-host, Nikki Chewbacca, a former federal civil rights attorney. Remember to subscribe to our show on your favorite platform. You can find us online at standshow.org and on YouTube at The Stand Show. You can also follow us on social media. We're at Kelly for Alaska, and let's keep growing our community of standouts. Invite friends to subscribe to our show and follow us on social media. This week, we will send a free sticker of Stand to one lucky person who leaves a review for the show. So make sure to leave a review for Stand on your favorite platform or at The Stand Show on YouTube. We're so amped today to have Alex Bruce with us, an epic social media influencer. You've probably already heard of him. Alex is the founder and CEO of X Strategies, a political consulting firm that helps promote and elect America first leaders. It's rated one of the fastest growing companies in the Southeast by Inc. Magazine. And get this, Alex founded the firm when he was just 19 years old. In 2022, Alex wrote the book, Winning the Social Media War. In this book, he outlines principles and practices for how to effectively use social media to positively influence our culture. And now he's regularly considered as a candidate for national political office. Welcome to Stand, Alex. We're happy to have you with us today. Hey, thanks for having me, Kelly. It's great to be with you. It's great to be with you. We're so glad. Yeah, I'd love to kick this off, Alex, with a question for you. I'm really excited to talk to you. I was fascinated by your starting X Strategies. Um, as I understand it, it's, it's, a, it's a firm that's focused and known for identifying potential conservative political candidates and then making them household names. What inspired you to start X Strategies when you were just 19 years old? I mean, when I was 19, I was thinking about things like <laughs> spring break. What was my major going to be? And here you are founding uh, X Strategies, this amazing company that's doing incredible work. So uh, tell us about what led you to start that. Well, thank you for the kind words. And it's certainly been a fun ride, uh, you know, and, and kind of it was just luck. Uh, I was just a dumb 16 year old, 17 year old that was shit posting. Uh, part of my French on Twitter uh, about my support of Governor Scott Walker at the time, about President Trump. I think I was retweeted by Donald Trump for the first time uh, when I was 17 years old sitting in study hall. And wow. I dedicated the next nine years of my life to becoming a Twitter troll in defense of President Trump. And uh, another thing changed, and President Trump brought politics online. And uh, it's something that I grew up with. I grew up with social media. I grew up with this technology where a lot of the other consultants in Washington, D.C. are, you know, in their late 30s to early 40s, a little, they were a little bit uh, behind the trend when it came to social media. And so I was like, hey, look, I can do this. And I met my business partner, Derek, who is also proficient in uh, growing social media accounts. And uh, he's a little bit older than I am. And he took a chance on investing in a 19-year-old uh uh, let's let's just say I was not the the sharp guy I am today when I was 19, but Derek took a big chance on, on me, and uh, thankfully it worked out. That's amazing. I mean, it takes a lot of a lot of courage and a lot of vision to do that at at 19, and it continues to take a lot of courage uh, yeah. because of the things that that you stand for. Uh, where do you develop, and how did you find that kind of courage, Alex? Well, I was raised uh, by my mom, a uh, single parent household, and uh, my mom was very tough on me. And, uh, you know, she, she was the most courageous, she is the most courageous person I know. And so she kind of instilled that in me. She instilled confidence in me. Uh, you know, she works in real estate, so she's very sociable and social. And so I kind of just followed her around and learned a lot of those, I guess, people skills, you could say. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just have never been any other way. I've always been uh, myself. And, some people like me, some people don't, but I don't lose sleep over those who don't per se. And so we just have some fun out there. And President Trump, again, he totally changed the game. You know, when you look at politics, the way politics has been for, uh, I guess, my entire life, uh, up until about seven years ago, it was a certain type of person that got involved with Republican politics. They all, a lot of them were the country club conservatives, the folks who, the 
you know, uh, grew up in the perfectly beautiful nuclear family, which I'm a big fan of, and I absolutely encourage that. But a lot of Republicans that grew up, uh, you know, I grew up on Badger Care, for example, state-run health care, uh, and that wasn't a po popular position among uh, the Republican Party. And so a lot of people that kind of grew up in my upbringing, they felt left behind by the Republican Party. But then President Trump came along. And he said, hey, I am for you guys. I am for the forgotten men and women of America. I am for the working class. I have your back. And uh, so a lot, it attracted a lot of different people into politics, into the Republican Party in particular. And so a lot of outsiders uh, like me kind of were able to find a lane and, and get in. And uh, I'm really inspired and encouraged by all of the fresh faces of the Republican Party. And I think that we have a beautiful future. Alex, you've got a really great story. I mean, even just in a couple of questions so far, um, you grew up in a situation that you hear that story from other people and it's, you know, victim lane and poor me and I can't really get above my station and I take a lot of handouts and that's not the story that your mom gave you. Instead, she built you up and taught you to live with a lot of courage and taught you to fight. Uh, showed you some ropes and, you know, at 19, you're an entrepreneur and you're a little bit indifferent to the people who slam doors in your faces, which is obviously something you learned from your mom, who was a businesswoman as a single parent. And I mean, the other story I like is if you take out the strong feelings people have about President Trump, um, somebody with a lot of power paid attention to you and um, gave you some wind beneath your wings at a young age. And I think that that that's a lesson for all of us that sometimes people will go around and feel like, well, what can I do? I can't make a difference. Just paying attention to and believing in one person who's maybe a teenager, um, that changed the whole trajectory of your life. And I mean, that, you're in study hall, right? <laughs> I have kids in study hall, teenagers in study hall this week. Well, I you know, hope they're not tweeting. <laughs> right. And if one of them were to unfortunately be on social media, I mean, just the idea that somebody who has a little bit of influence or um, that they would esteem or respect in our community would pay attention to them and something that they were doing could have that kind of influence on you. It's a really big deal. Um, I like that kind of story. I want to talk about your book because you do more than just um, put things out on social media that actually have navigated the nation. You, you're a bit of a rudder on the boat that is our country for those who who aren't on Alex's um, feeds and social media pages. Uh, but you also did something in passing that knowledge on to others. I think it's really significant. This book you wrote, Winning the Social Media War. Um, I want to just ask you, how can conservatives, because this is what you wrote about in your book, win back influence over culture using social media? I'd like to just hear kind of a high level overview of what you would say to all the people who think that there's not really much hope left. Yeah, well, I think um, I, I definitely understand where the folks who feel discouraged are coming from. Uh, we watched how the major social media companies in Silicon Valley, they right. worked in tandem to undermine uh, our country's election in, the, in 2020. Uh, they worked in tandem to suppress the greatest political stand scandal in American history in the Hunter Biden laptop and the Joe Biden corruption. Uh, and that had a massive impact on the election. And let's not even get into uh, the different the voting mechanisms that were used. And uh, but that that major instance alone swung the election by, you know, 17 percent of Democrats said that they would not have voted for Joe Biden had they known about right. the Hunter Biden laptop. And they would have known about it if the social media companies didn't suppress free speech. Correct. And so it, I definitely understand the discouragement. However, uh, you know, with Elon Musk taking over Twitter and unleashing uh, free speech back on Twitter, uh, it, which I do believe is the most impactful platform in politics. I think that a lot of the younger people, they like TikTok and they like uh, Instagram, but where the true influencers who can influence the politics where they play is on Twitter. And so Elon has brought that back and uh, it, we're actually seeing a major difference, I think. And so we're seeing fewer and fewer uh, hoaxes spread like wildfire on, on Twitter, uh, because what happens is the story starts on Twitter it spreads through the media because that's where all the journalists cover. And then it trickles mm -hmm. into the other social media platforms and the other influencers on the different platforms share. And so stopping the, the, where the hoax starts 
uh, that's what Elon did. And so that's that's a major win for us. But I think that re Republicans need to stop being so corny. I think there's a lot of corny Republicans out there that push people away. Um, and so, you know, I like uh, people like Byron Donalds, for example, or Ana Paulina Luna or uh, Wesley Hunt or President Trump. They have a sense of swagger to them. They're fun. They're, uh, you know, a little bit more aligned with the current uh, population. Uh, and so we, we just need to continue to platform uh, more voices like theirs uh, and, and make sure that the uh, people uh, online don't think of uh, Mitch McConnell, per se, as the Republican Party. Uh, thank you for sharing all of that. <laughs> I think that I know you're a big fan. I, I think that. One of the things I hear in there that you said that I think is really important is don't be afraid of social media and use it to your advantage and to leverage it. Um, a lot of people in in our position, people who share conservative values, um, they won't even touch Twitter. And what I just heard you say is that's actually where kind of the root of ideas and free speech uh, start and then they spread to these other platforms. Exactly. And I'll give you an example if you don't mind. I'm yeah. sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you up. I'll give you an example on that. Uh, one of the first moments that we actually realized the importance and the power of Twitter was during the Parkland school shooting. Right after the Parkland mm -hmm. school shooting, what was happening? If you created a new Twitter account and your first people suggested follows were David Hogg, Emma Gonzalez, and another gun grabbing student that was politicizing the tragic occurrence in Parkland. And, and so there's this narrative being spread to try to take away our Second Amendment rights to, mm -hmm. to you know, infringe upon uh, the God-given right to self-defense. And what we were able to do in a very short moment, a short time, is that a lot of conservative players, we were able to identify uh, a few conservative voices to platform to counter the narrative. And so this is when folks like Kyle Cashew who was also a student at the at Parkland was able to get on the Pierce Morgan because of a viral tweet. Got and, it. You know, and combat that narrative. You had Andrew Pollock, whose daughter, beautiful daughter Meadow, was killed in that shooting, who was able to get a massive voice and invited to the White House to share his story and mm. push back against the leftist lies. And so we were able to counteract the forced leftist agenda and platforming of these uh, students by platforming our own voices. And so there's, there's these constant battles that were kind of happening in Twitter 1.0 uh, that aren't as much happening anymore because the left doesn't have the d advantage of having all of the you It's know, more internal... of an equal field. It is. And yeah. so and when it's an equal field and there's significantly more of us because I do believe we are the silent majority and we're not silent as much on Twitter anymore. And so uh, we're winning these wars now online and, and and the left doesn't know what to do about it. And that's where they have to arrest our top political opponent. More on this after our break. Get into the battle and get into the game. Uh, you can get Alex's book to figure out how. Winning the Social Media War. It's available online. It's everywhere from Amazon to Kindle to Walmart. Make sure to get it. Get the game plan. We'll be back after the break. We're on YouTube at The Stand Show standshow.org follow us on social media kelly for alaska stand by leave a review be entered to win free sticker from the show stand stand by becca is a private security services company operating in alaska and across the u.s with nearly a decade of experience providing personal protection medical support surveillance and facility event armed and transport security WECA provides state-of-the-art security forces by utilizing current and former law enforcement officers, former military, and medical personnel to provide for a client's needs in all situations. For more information on WECA and its security services, contact 260-337-8263. We're back on stand with social media expert and political strategist, Alex Bruzewitz. Make sure to leave a review this week. The episode is on stand on your favorite podcast platform. We'll select one lucky audience member who left a review to receive a free sticker from the show. Alex, when we first met, we were in a very small meeting with one of the most senior members of the GOP. And I watch as you very respectfully yet very artfully challenged this party's leaders' decisions to finance and support candidates who would actually vote Democrat, even though they were elected Republican, instead of the, the leaders supporting conservative candidates who are running in the districts. 
I believe a house divided cannot stand. So I wanted to ask you, as a strong political strategist, what is the path forward for maximum effectiveness of the Republican Party at the national level? Well, that was a fun that was a fun conversation we had. I yeah, don't that, think that, it was uh, fun for that person. I'll leave that person gender neutral. <laughs> so, so that guy flies to Palm Beach and he wants a big check from a donor. Uh, just want to share this story with your audience. But he wants a big check from a donor. And the donor calls me up. I'm in the gym. I'm like, uh, you know, she's like, Alex, I need you to come over to my house. He's about to be here. I want you to ask him some questions. I'm like, you know what? Fine, I'll come over. And uh, he sits down and he's doing what they do. And they kiss ass and talk about how wonderful he is and the great plans that they have. And I just politely say, sir, why are you raising money for uh, people that voted to impeach Trump? And uh, the donor wasn't aware of that. And uh, I don't think he left with the big check that he flew all the way down there for. And so I, think you're right. uh, I, I see his team or I see him out uh, and, and I see those folks out. They don't like me too much, but that's all right. Uh, but look, I think that to, to be fair, Alex, you didn't just ask one question. <laughs> uh, oh, OK, maybe I asked a couple. Um, but look, I don't think that the Republican Party is the answer to all the problems. I think for for many of the problems that that we face as a nation, uh, the traditional Republican Party has left so many people behind. They have mm-hmm. failed us. Um, and I think Donald Trump and the mega movement has saved the Republican Party. I like to say that I grew up in Ripon, Wisconsin, which is the birthplace of the Republican Party. Abraham Lincoln was there in 1854. We have a little white schoolhouse there. And, uh, but that Republican Party that Abraham Lincoln founded, it was great, you know, let's say under Ronald Reagan, but post Reagan, we were losers. I, I really do think we were losers. I think George W. Bush was one of the worst presidents uh, in the history of our country. I think he was in, incredibly uh, damaging. Uh, and, you know, because of him, we have, you know, before Trump, we didn't win the White House with a traditional Republican since 2004. And so that's why I think it's so hysterical that the Republicans think that we can win without Trump and we just can't do it. The MAGA movement is the only reason the Republican Party is still alive. And so uh, I think that the Washington Republicans, a lot of them, they have tremendous contempt for people like us, for people who align themselves with more uh, of the mega policies. And, and and because of that, they, they try to undermine us. And so we, we need a Republican Party that respects its base. We need leaders who recognize that they are in Washington to serve and not uh, to serve the people, not serve themselves. And so I think a lot of people get to Washington and they forgot who sent them there. A lot of people go up with good intentions. You saw what happened when a lot of people came in through the Tea Party movement. A, a favorite of mine mm-hmm. is booster seat Adam Kinzinger. You know, a very short man turned out to be a crying man in Congress, tried to subpoena me, had, you know, total loser now. But uh, what happened is he came through the Tea Party movement, but then he got in bed with. Oh. Uh, the big donors and the Raytheons and the big war and everybody that hates our country. And he totally turned his back and sold out. And so that's what happens too many times. And so the people need to hold them accountable and uh, we, we can't have unity with people that don't respect us. And so uh, the base needs to hold people's feet to the fire. I think we did a really good job of that in uh, 2022. We took out nine of the 10 impeachment rhinos. Uh, I think that uh, it's disappointing uh, how your race turned out, but I do think your your voting system's kind of corrupt. I don't like the ranked choice, and I think it's uh, I think that's very dangerous for our country. And I think other states were leading that way, and we can't let that happen. And so, um, but we did a really good job of taking out those who didn't align with us, and now we're doing a good job of making sure that uh, the Republicans in the House they do what we sent them to do. And so mm-hmm. we're not we're not at 100 percent yet, but I think we're better than we where we were in 2016. And uh, I think we're at 75 percent. And this is what X Strategies is totally dedicated to. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, many people talk about unity. I want to pick up on this unity team theme, unity among Republicans. Um, you're a bold critic of what we would call rhinos, Republican in name only. But we're a party that supports diversity of views and opinions. We love that, but not a party that doesn't like hypocrisy when people only say they say one thing, like you just mentioned, Adam, and then do another. We don't like that. We respect compromise, but not cowardly capitulation. 
there's a difference, right? You've got to, in D.C., you have to compromise to get things done, but you can't compromise on principles because that's right. capitulation. So what are your thoughts on how we can continue to promote diversity within the party without promoting compromise of the platform, compromise of integrity? What, is, what does that look like to, to be unity within the party while also promoting diversity? Well, um, I, I, I think the compromise angle, I'm not a big fan of compromise at the moment because I don't know how you compromise with the modern day Democrat Party. Uh, the Democrats in Washington, they are pro uh, birth up until the moment they're supposed to, or abortion up until the moment of birth. Uh, even in some cases, the post birth abortion. They're, the Democrats are in favor of mutilating the genitalia of young children and the sick and satanic child sex changes. The Democratic Party of 2023 is not the Democrat Party of the 1990s. And that's where a lot of Republicans need to get, get in their minds. And so you can't compromise with evil people. You have to defeat them. And we have too many people in Washington that want to go or get elected and go to Washington that want to be invited to the cool parties. They want to be accepted by the, the mainstream press. And they, they forget the meaning of their job. And a lot of the folks, you can tell if they refer to themselves as congressmen instead of representative, I think that's a good tell. And so, you know, mm -hmm. they're supposed to represent the people, uh, but too many of them represent themselves. And so, uh, but right now we are at a tipping point in our country. We, we are facing a, uh, we're facing a threat of communism that I don't think we've, we've seen yet in this country. We, we have, um, you know, 19 co-conspirators allegedly down in Georgia that just got arrested. We have President Trump, who's been arrested four times now. Uh, we have a fifth indictment likely coming with the superseding indictment. And so uh, we need a Republican Party that is willing to fight back. And if you're not up for the fight, then you shouldn't be there. I don't care if you want to play patty cake with Nancy Pelosi mm. and do some insider stock trading. Get the hell out. Like, we need people who are prepared for this moment. We need people who uh, have courage. We need people who have convictions and we have people who won't compromise. Um, and, you know, we are just too far gone and, and we need to turn the tables on the left. And then maybe 10 years down the road, we can look at compromising and having some civil discourse. But uh, we are really up against an enemy that that we, we need to defeat. And if we don't, we won't have a country anymore. Those are all good points. You know, you you've already covered a little bit of this, uh, Alex, but just want to see if you have anything you want to add. Uh, talk about the 2024 uh, upcoming election. Uh, my question is, how do Republicans win this cycle, uh, not just the presidency, but the down ballot races, too? And you've talked about holding people's feet to the fire. You've talked about social media. Uh, is there anything else, any more teeth that you want to add to that? Uh, in terms of what you think we need to do strategically? Well, I think it's important. I think the map is shrinking. The map is totally shrunk. Um, there's this idea that we're going to have this ma major super majority in, in the House. I just think with the way the demographics are now, uh, that's just impossible. But I think it's important that we hold this House, maybe pick up a couple more seats. Uh, but I think something that uh, can be done is the Republicans in Washington, they need to deliver on the promises that they campaigned on in 2022. Because if they don't do what they said they were going to do, why mm. would voters turn out for them? And I think one of the big things that w the voters want is they want to see Joe Biden impeached. I think they want to see Mayorkas dragged before Congress and have to answer questions about why the hell he left our border wide open. I think they want to see Ukraine funding come to a pause. Like, there's so many things the Republican Party campaigned on during the midterms that gave them the House majority that they're just failing to act on right now. And I think part of it's because uh, there's a few folks in Washington that don't want things to change. Uh, I think in the Senate in particular, I think Senate leadership wants to lose because they hate Trump more than they love our country. And so, you know, after the midterms, you had a lot of situations in the 2022 midterms where our candidates were underfunded. You know, there's a right. situation where Mitch, Mitch McConnell and his staff were literally calling donors in Arizona and saying, do not support Flake Masters. Screw that guy. And like uh, when you have the Senate leadership undermining our Senate candidates and supporting people like Lisa Murkowski uh, instead of true patriots in important states and important districts, uh, that is not a recipe for success. 
and people weren't held accountable for that. But the, the thing is, they wanted to lose in 2022 because they wanted to try to take out Trump. They wanted to blame Trump for the midterms. Right. Uh, and, and for a little bit, that was successful. That narrative was successful. Rob DeSantis was kind of rising in the polls. Uh, but then people were like, wait a second. I didn't know that Mitch McConnell was calling donors and suggesting that they don't donate to our candidates. That's kind of bizarre. And so when they took a pause and they actually learned the truth, then they're like, yeah, Trump's still our guy. So, um, but the, the success, I guess, is do not go against the base. And I think the Republicans in Washington, if they're playing with fire, if they try to go against Trump and then uh, make sure our candidates are funded. And so there's, there's a few things that you can do. So stand with Trump, fund your candidates and deliver on your promises if you're elected in Washington. Good stuff. We will be right back. Don't go away. Africa New Day with mission is actually to create leaders, change a culture, and transform a nation. We believe that this is an area where God wants us to make a difference. You know, he has called us the light of the world. Well, where does the light shine? Where there is darkness. As you pray with us, as you contribute to our efforts, we believe that together we can make a difference. We are back with political strategist and social media influencer, Alex Brusowitz. Make sure to leave a review for this episode, and we'll select one person who's going to receive a free gift. So don't forget to leave a review. Uh, Alex, you promote and help elect conservative fighters, uh, and your company, X Strategies, prides itself on being activists first. Your focus isn't making money. It's doing what's right. Tell us about uh, a client you've worked with who really inspired you, a standout among the fighters that you've helped. Well, we've been blessed to be able to work with so many uh, over the years, and um, there's a lot that come to mind. But, you know, one of my best friends turned uh, became a congresswoman. Her name's Ana Paulina Luna. And, you know, I've been working with Ana for uh, six years, uh, first as, uh, you know, trying to help her identify her voice as an influencer. Uh, she ran for Congress for the first time uh, back in the 2020 cycle against uh, former Florida Governor Charlie Crist, who uh, was the runaway favorite. He was supposed to win by like 20 percent. Uh, we got that race within six points uh, in 2020. She never got discouraged. She never gave up the fight. She threw her hat back in the ring. Um, and uh, just a few months after that, she won by 13% in 2022. She's an Air Force veteran. She's in her early 30s. And, uh, you know, she, she was pregnant. And then she, she's pregnant. She just had her baby. God bless. Aww. And uh, But while pregnant, young Anna Polina Luna is on the House floor delivering a censure of Adam Schiff. And she, she, a freshman congresswoman, did more to hold Adam Schiff accountable than any of the rhinos that have been there for, for decades. So... Uh, our new class, our new generation of fighters, and I, I mentioned a couple earlier, but uh, Byron Donalds uh, in Florida 19, I think he's got a brilliant and bright future. Uh, you know, J.D. Van, senator from Ohio, uh, you know, Lauren Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, Anna Polina Luna, Wesley Hunt, uh, Lance Gooden. I think this young generation of Republicans who, who learned politics in the Trump era are really going to be forces to be reckoned with for for many years to come. Uh, it's a different type of politics. It's a more relatable politics, and uh, the backstories of these people are uh, much more interesting than the traditional backstories of oh, I became a lawyer and then I became a politician and this and this and this and that. Like Anna Polina Luna was an air. She was supposed to go to medical school. She was brilliant. She was an Air Force veteran. She became the Hispanic Outreach Director for Turning Point USA overall badass and uh you know she's inspiring a lot more people to get involved and when you put somebody like Anna Paulina Luna out there as the face of the Republican Party instead of Mitch McConnell as the face of the Republican Party I think that's a winning formula yeah like you said it creates lanes for other people to enter into oh I can see me in this um yeah, I think it's great if you want to learn more about her about Alex's friend who went from ordinary American to extraordinary leader for the country. Uh, she's at voteonapaulina.com. Well, you're talking about this next generation of, of leaders. So let's, let's 
uh, let's stay on that theme for a moment. Uh, I'm thinking about this, the, the, the next level down, the, the younger folks who are upcoming, high school, college, you know, university. How do we help them detoxify from a lot of the junk and the falsehoods that they're reading on social media, that they're hearing in the mainstream media, and that they're being indoctrinated with in, in academia? Yeah, I think uh, parents need to step up. Uh, that's number one. Uh, my mom had, you know, I'd, I'd sit there and watch. Back when Fox News was a good network, I'd sit there in the living room with my mom and watch Fox News every night. And she's like, "This is the this is the way, Alex. This is the truth. I, I got I got you, mom." And so, uh, you know, it's important to to raise your kids and and be there for your kids. I think a lot of parents they kind of check out. Uh, and they allow the school system or they allow social media to raise their children for them. And I think that's led to tremendous damage to our country and to the minds of our youth. Uh, you know, and, and I, but, but I understand like parents, they have to work, most parents now, to, to feed your family. You have to have two incomes in the household. Uh, you, both parents have to work. And your kid is stuck with the teacher for 10 hours out of the day. And then they come home and they're tired and this and that. And so, uh, you know, we, we have a, a major problem in our country. And I think we need to get back to promoting and supporting the nuclear family. Ideally, we can figure out a solution for families to be raised off of one uh, household income uh, like they used to. And uh, I think there's ways you can go about that. But it's important for families to be together. I think church and community is also important. Uh, but you know, we, we, there's certainly a psychological warfare happening on our young mm. people. And, uh, I think my generation, I, I'm getting old. I just turned 26. And so, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I think there's, I think there's hope for the, the, the 20 and youngers, but not so much hope for the, the 26 to 35 year olds. Mm. Yeah, Alex, I think I love your value on the role of the parents. We talk a lot about parental rights when it comes to schools. I don't think parents surrender their rights when they send kids to schools, but they also don't surrender their responsibilities. Mm -hmm. It's not right. the school's responsibilities to raise our kids. And like you said, there's been a lot of outsourcing happening in our in our culture. And uh, there's such a strong role for parents to um, shape the hearts and the minds of their children. I really like how you said that. So there's been some talk, and I would say some enthusiastic support for you to run for Congress, to be our next Anna Polina Luna, if you will. And I would like to hear, um, what would you say are kind of top of your mind for the pressing challenges facing our country that you would like to address? We would see you on the floor of Congress introducing some bills or some resolutions. You say, okay, if, if it's Representative Alex making lanes for people, um, what would you want to take care of if you were uh, in, the, in Congress or in the Senate for us? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, there's there was certainly some speculation, but I want to put r those rumors to rest. I'm not running anytime soon, but I think it would be fun. And I think we would do well if we did run eventually. But um, look, I think our I think supporting the family is one of the major things for me. Um, a lot of folks feel left behind by um, the current way of our country and the current politician structure and um, making sure that our families feel uh support is, is key to me. I, I think child tax credits are, are, are a major, uh, I never want abortion to happen because of economic reasons. I think a lot of women, they say that they can't afford to have a child and so they can't have it, they won't have a child. And so um, I think J.D. Vance and Josh Hawley are onto something with the uh, child tax credits and the family tax credits and making it a little bit more affordable to, to have children. Uh, I think that's number. That's a big priority of mine. Another priority of mine would be ending the weaponization of the justice system. I think that is the greatest threat that we face uh, to date. Uh, we're seeing not only them persecuting President Trump, but many of Trump's uh, loyal, most loyal supporters. Uh, today or yesterday, Peter Navarro, a top advisor of his, faced a contempt of Congress case because he refused to comply with the BS subpoena from the January 6th committee. Uh, but, you know, and, and not just going after President Trump, but they're going after pro-life centers and, uh, and Catholic churches, and they're going after people that they just deem enemies of their agenda. And that is dangerous, and we can't stand for that. And so uh, if I was in Congress on day one, I'd be looking at dragging uh, Christopher Wray and, and some of the top officials before Congress demanding answers. If the answers aren't uh, acceptable, then we'd look at slashing the budget and possibly defunding it. But we have to go 
to bat against these folks because uh, they are truly undermining our country. And if they succeed, our country will cease to exist. Mm hmm. Yeah, Congress returning to its rightful role of holding the executive branch accountable. Sounds what a concept. Yeah, what what a concept. Uh, let's jump into this. After the twenty twenty election, you were speaking out pretty boldly on election integrity, and your advocacy got coverage by millions of people. It also got you targeted. You mentioned this before by the J six committee. Um, you were the object of a lot of hate on social media, and you. Um, must have gone through a pretty intense and difficult time. But I wanted to ask, what was the experience like for you? You chose to stand firm and demand election integrity. You were viciously targeted by Congress itself and by the media, but you really stood firm. You demanded that your constitutional rights were respected. And I wanted to ask, um, how did you press through that? What motivated you when it kind of looked by all accounts you were standing alone? Well, you know, um, it, it's it's actually kind of funny how that that happened. So you know, about a year, it was about a year between uh, January sixth and me being contacted by the by the committee. And uh, during that year, I was doing a lot of reflecting. I was seeing a lot of the stories about these families being ripped apart, about the FBI busting down these folks' doors and arresting them for simply waving a flag at the Capitol that day, and they're being thrown in these awful conditions. And I felt bad that I wasn't speaking out more in defense of these people. I, I wasn't doing enough to support these people. And so uh, I donated $50,000 to support some of the families of the J6 defendants, uh, support some of the people who are being uh, persecuted uh, by either the FBI or the J6 committee. I felt just horrible. But, and so I publicized my donation. And two days after I make this donation, I get a letter from the January 6th committee. Alex, we believe you have information related to January 6th, which I don't. But they said they saw me support these people. They didn't want me to support these people, so they went to financially hurt me. And then they made up all these, you know, BS questions to ask me, which obviously they knew I knew nothing about. Hence, why my name is mentioned exactly zero times in the 950-page January 6 report. And so they, they, the process is the punishment. They want to mm. put us through hell. They want to try to torture us. And I just found fun in it. I, I honestly. Uh, got through it because I thought these people were jokes, uh, but bad jokes. I think they're dangerous jokes. Uh, but I'm not going to let uh, Adam Kinzinger or uh, Liz Cheney or Benny Thompson intimidate me. And so we we had some fun with it. So when I showed up to the J6 testimony, I was wearing a hat that said subpoenaed on it. And, uh, you know, we, we, we did what we had to do. And um, but you can't let these people feel like they would. And so you can you have to stand strong and um, you can't break. And President Trump, I think he shows that each and every day. I don't know what other 77 year old man could withstand four arrests, two indictments, you know, the Mueller probe, uh, seven years of disgusting and disgraceful lies. Uh, but he also finds peace in the chaos. And I guess I've been watching that guy too closely for the last seven years. And uh, I don't really mind the social media hate or what, what people do to me. I actually find it kind of entertaining. Thanks, Alex. It's a great response. Thank you so much for being with us today. Your stories are definitely an inspiration. We appreciate it. And we'll be back right after this break. Alex, you're welcome back on the show anytime. And you can get Alex's book, Winning the Social Media War, online. Thanks so much. Right. Stand by. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. Welcome back to Stand. You're with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca, and we just finished our interview with Alex Brucewitz, an amazing social media influencer who wrote the book, Winning the Social Media War, talking about how conservatives can win back influence just by using social media. He talked about how Twitter is the new platform. It's kind of where everything originates. And if you're a little bit hesitant about how to go about influencing your friends and family and neighbors or a broader audience, we totally recommend getting his book. It's available online on Amazon, on Kindle, etc. Or you can just pick it up at your local Walmart or bookstore. So I wanted to chat with you, my favorite chat buddy, <laughs> <laughs> about what we just heard from Alex. So I've found this theme super interesting. Alex talked about how he was raised by a single mom and he learned from her 
um, how to kind of stand for these principles and values of work hard and um, you can you can make it, you can do it, you're not a victim, uh, gets noticed by, you know, somebody who was someone he looked up to. And then he admittedly makes some squirrely mistakes along the way, but kind of then grows into, we're now seven years down the road, um, one of the fastest growing political strategy companies in the country and has had some really significant wins. Um, he didn't go into bragging a lot on himself. However, he's a really large social media influencer, meaning he has a really big effect on doing things like shaping politics in the country. He mentions that really big donor. It is a really big donor. <laughs> so much so that the heads of the Republican Party are coming to her house because she has that much effect on the money distribution in the Republican Party. She calls him and says, I need you to come over here to help me figure out how to navigate whether or not to give donations to this part of the party or that part of the party. Um, that conversation was really interesting to witness, by the way. <laughs> um, he knows the ins and outs of all the candidates running in all of the 535 races across the country and which ones to get into and not get into. But what I thought is really interesting in the theme that he developed is just as he was mentored to become this person on the front lines of standing for what he believes, he's now lifting up and mentoring people that they would become national leaders. Ana Paulina Luna was not much of anything five to 10 years ago. Now she's one of the movers and shakers of our country. Why? Because one of her friends, Alex, helped her. And how did he help her? In the same way that people helped him. And in this case, we would just say just a mom. And what I think is really important in that is there's a lot of just a people who are probably listening and watching right now who think, well, you know, there's not much I can do. When you listen to the stories of great, significant, influential people, they he didn't stand up or show up before the J6 committee and have the victory that he had and persevere through all of that kind of thinking this is humorous. I imagine it was stressful, but humorous and something that he was going to just get through because that was the first conflict he came up across. Alex had been getting and enduring through hate and pushback and resistance and challenging huge leaders of the party and all these things for days and weeks and months and years before then. And probably had seen a lot of doors slammed in his mom's face and a lot of resistance that she got. And this had been modeled along the way. Um, he was just a person who was coached by just a people. And you, you take on these small battles, trained by mentors and people ahead of you, before you take on medium battles, before you take on big battles. And I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts, because I know this is something that you're really passionate about. I've seen you do this our entire relationship, um, just ordinary people can have extraordinary influence. And sometimes you don't get to witness it yourself. You just end up being the shoulders that other great people stand on, which can often be more rewarding. And you might not realize that you're that person standing on someone else's shoulders, but the little battles you're fighting now are actually paving the way, even if they're little losses, paving the way for great victories later. Yeah, no, absolutely. I I really appreciated that illustration of the power of mentorship. Right. And I think particularly for our young people today coming out of the COVID pandemic and the, hmm. the hit on the economy, a lot of them are feeling like they don't have the same kind of opportunities and the same kind of future ahead of them that, say, uh, we we might have or our parents might have. And to have people who are a little farther ahead of you in life say, hey, you know what? You do have a future. I believe in you, and I'm going to invest in you, whether it's time, resource, just uh, advice, wisdom, encouragement. Open a network, introduce you to people. Absolutely. Those small things can make huge changes in somebody's life. Yeah, I think back to, you know, when I was in sixth grade, my grammar school teacher at the end of the year, they 
both both our grammar school teachers just I, I gave all the kids a small little wooden figurine that they felt like represented the kid's personality or was illustrative of something they did that year that everybody remembered. And they they couldn't find a lawyer figurine, but they found uh, a figurine of a kid with uh, a graduate student, you know, the, the hat and the you know, black robes. And they said, we're giving this to you because we believe you're going to be a lawyer someday. And uh, my... My English teacher had told my mom, you know, your son just exhausts me because I was always asking questions, always arguing respectfully. Um, but I kept that wooden figurine. And yeah, I remember I still have it. It's like 35 years later. I remember in college looking at my by figurine on the desk, trying to figure out what am I going to do with my life when I graduate? And looking at that figurine and saying somebody saw something in me they saw this potential in me i see that i mm -hmm. think i can do that yeah so so that that i think uh alex's il illustration there that story is so powerful and i even think back to my father who uh when he was in a rural rural area in the democratic republic of congo there was one kid in his school who was selected to take an exam and the kids who got the top seven scores would get scholarships through USAID to come to the America to America to study. Mm. And his principal of all the kids in the school picked my father and said, would you like this opportunity? That was one small thing that made a huge difference. But then my dad couldn't afford to get to the testing center. Well, the principal was a bush pilot. People here in Alaska understand how right. important that can be for rural areas. He flew my dad to the testing site so that he could take his exam. So it's those small things. And that principal never knew, I think, what became of my father and how he became a very successful uh, business person and changed so many lives and made such a difference for the poor uh, and through his work throughout Africa. One but those, principal one principle mm -hmm. made that and that changed the course and direction of my life and my mm -hmm. sister's life and our children's lives and so um there is so much power in the belief in somebody and in investing in them and i think alex is a great example of that when alex is talking about like the impact that you can have on social media the impact of words or the impact of pictures and memes right um how you can convince someone i i think about even the start of our nation was really shaped by, if you will, meme culture, the political cartoon. We didn't have social media, but they did something similar. They would, they would gather in the bars and the taverns and pass around these political cartoons that really got people thinking about what are we doing under the rule of thumb of Britain and what's happening here? And early social media memes shaped our nation. I recently heard this story directly from a young leader about Alex's age who's got a leadership capacity in an organization nationally in political movement who told the story that the reason he became a conservative political leader so active is he was in college and he was like not that engaged politically at all. And they were out in a kind of student common area and there was a girl with a backpack on that had a Trump button. And she asked him, she just kind of turned around and asked him, well, who are you voting for in this election? And he said, well, I knew who she was voting for, but I didn't even know who was running. And he <laughs> said, well, I don't know. And she said, well, you need to vote for Trump. And here's why. And she was just really kind of, she, he didn't know her. Um, she was kind of passionate in her advocacy. And so he thought, well, you know, I probably should look into this. And he looked into it and he decided to vote. That was his journey in becoming a Republican. And so his exhortation to the audience and this talk he was giving was, um, your words have power. And even talking to people you don't know and just saying like one thing, like, who are you voting for? And here's why I'm voting for whoever. You have no idea the life altering difference you could be making and just changing the way somebody thinks. And I think um, developing the kind of courage where, yes, you might not be liked, but is that really your top value? Or is your top value making a difference, changing your community, serving people, pushing towards policy objectives? I thought it was interesting in that diversity question. 
and the compromise question, where compromise used to mean something different under President Reagan. You and I have had this talk um, because of all of the Democrat friends that we have. I think Democrat is distinct from some of the far left policies that are being pushed. Even though they're housed in the Democrat Party, we have a lot of friends who are Democrat who don't share those far left values. And you and I have talked about how there used to be a difference how you could kind of dialogue and disagree and debate and even reach compromise. Um, but just like Alex said, you can't compromise with things that are evil. There's there's just no reaching an agreement there. So fascinating discussion with Alex Bruzewitz. So I hope we can get him back on. Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode of Stand. Make sure to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. See our clips and shows on YouTube at The Stand Show. Follow us on Kelly for Alaska on social media. Our website is standshow.org. If you leave a review this week, you'll be entered to win a free sticker from the podcast Stand. And we will see you next week. Make sure to share this episode with a friend or family member to continue to grow our awesome community of standouts. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.